Hello, everybody. My name is Zinat Islam, and I'm the Relations Manager Academia Network at UNICENTER. Welcome to the 25th session of our YSBC web lecture series. The topic for today's conversation is the role of UNICENTER present, a past, present, and future. And today we have with us our speaker, our very own Ms. Lamia Morshed, who's the Executive Director at UNICENTER. Our moderator today is Ms. Susan Gibson, board member at Thomson Reuters Foundation. A bit, bit of background on our moderator and speaker today. Uh, Ms. Lamia Morshid has been the executive director of UNUS Center, the global hub for social business founded by Nobel laureate Professor Mohamed Yunus uh, since his inception in 2008. Uh, she has previously served for 12 years as director development of Grameen Trust, which sets up microcredit programs around the world. Ms. Lamia serves as the managing director of Brahmin Healthcare Trust and is a board member of uh, and is a member of board of trustees of the YY Foundation, board member of Grameen Healthcare Services, Grameen Creative Lab, the Uno Social Business, and the Grameen Caledonian College of Nursing. Uh, she also chairs the YY Ventures. Ms. Lamia has been a speaker at numerous high-level international conferences and summits around the world on the subject of microcredit and social business, and regularly serves as a judge for social business, global social business competition. As I said, our moderator today is Ms. Susan Gibson, who's a board member at Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, she has been working where she has worked and volunteered in the nonprofit world for more than 35 years in 70 countries. In 1992, she visited Bangladesh, where she got her training in microfinance at Grameen Bank. From 1992 to 2001, she was a consultant providing technical assistance and conducting workshops in team building, communications, and microfinance principles for NGOs, UN agencies, and donor governments. Currently, Ms. Susan is a philanthropist actively engaged in NGOs in areas of refugees, human rights, and education for girls. She's on the board of the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which focuses on advancing media freedom, fostering inclusive economies, and promoting human rights. Ms. Susan has just written a book called How to Be an Amazing Volunteer Overseas, Rules of the, War, Rules of the Road, Stories from the Field, in which she shares advice with the next generation of change makers. So today's lecture session is going to be a super interesting one, especially since it's on the topic of UNICENTER and there are always queries on what UNICENTER does. So I'm sure this is going to be very informative and uh, let us not delay further and request Professor Mahmoud Yunus for his opening remarks. Professor Yunus. Thank you, Zina. It's a wonderful day uh, to have both Lamia and uh, Susan together because uh, their history begins together in uh, Bangladesh. Lamia just started her career after school. Uh, she finished school, she joined Grameen Trust. And that's about the time Susan came to Bangladesh. That's where the connection, it's a lifelong connection and friendship that built together. So we are just going over all those days, remembering all those days that uh, she was here with us, uh, Susan was with us. Uh, today, uh, Lamia is on the spotlight. She is always behind the spotlight, organizing everybody else's spotlight. Now today she is on the spotlight and she'll be talking about the uh, UNO Center. She is the living history of uh, UNO Center. So everything that goes on that uh, was, uh, did happen in UNO Center, she remembers everything. And uh, all the plans and programs uh, comes to her and uh, implemented to her. So this is a person who can give UNO Center a, a 360 degree view of what it is and what it is like. Uh, she is the architect of the UNICE Center. It's not only a historian uh, or a person who has lived through UNICE Center. Uh, she is also the architect who designed it. She did, made it happen. Uh, she is virtually the soul of uh, UNICE Center. So everything uh, revolves around her. So this is a good occasion to see in her perspective what she sees about the past and the present and also the future of UNICE Center. So we are very lucky to have this uh, presentation from her today. And Susan, as uh, I was mentioning, uh, one thing I should uh, remember with you, uh, something happened in 1988, uh, CBS 60 Minutes uh, presented a segment on uh, Grameen Bank, uh, Banker to the Poor, that uh, it was about uh, 25 minutes segment that they showed in the CBS 60 Minutes. 
how many people were touched by that uh, uh, little presentation in 60 minutes? I'm amazed. I meet people completely unknown uh, uh, who said, oh, I remember I saw you on CBS 60 Minutes. And that made the impression. And many people changed because of the way uh, they saw uh, the Grameen Bank and the ability of poor people taking charge of their own life and so on. One of them is uh, Susan uh, here today. Uh, so Susan was, Susan's history begins with CBS 60 Minutes slot. And this is how she got curious. She was working at a bank at that time. Uh, she decided instead of just watching it for 25 minutes, why doesn't she come to Bangladesh and see it there thoroughly? So she left her job back in Canada and came to Bangladesh knowing nothing about Bangladesh, uh, but became very involved in Bangladesh. She's still we're just chatting. She still remembers her Bangla, how to negotiate with the baby taxi wala, uh, how to fix the fare, that, and all those details. And, the amazing thing is not only she came to Bangladesh, it transformed her completely. Her life has changed because she was uh, here. And at that age, uh, all the things that she has gone through, that's a book about, I'm sure uh, you'll like to read her book uh, that she has uh, documented what she has done in her some funny way, some very difficult way. She has to tackle with the problems that she faced at that time. Uh, so uh, we're very happy to have her with us and she has become a lifelong friend with us and we continue to remain in close touch. Today we're very happy she'll be moderating and she's the best person to do it for Lamia. So Susan, it's all yours now. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Bonobad, uh, Professor Yunus, it's really a pleasure. Come on action, Lamia. It's a real <laughs> pleasure to be here. My Bangla is very limited after 29 years of not practicing, practicing it very much. But as you say, uh, it's incredible. One experience or introduction uh, through the 60 Minutes television interview, I was uh, going to grad school at the time. I had left banking and uh, and as soon as I saw the interview, I thought, I, I want to learn from him and the workers at Grameen Bank. This is fantastic what they're doing. So it was my intention um, to come to Grameen Bank, which I did. In those days, it was faxes. So it was a little hard to make a plan. And uh, so I just decided it was worth taking the chance and uh, sort of showed up on your doorstep. <laughs> but I'm very grateful because I spent four months and learned from uh, your staff, uh, the Grameen Bank workers, and of course, the borrowers. And uh, the, the, those experiences changed uh, the direction of my life. And I was very fortunate to be able to uh, talk about microfinance and do training um, in many countries. And uh, it was all the lessons that I learned in, in Bangladesh. So there's a very big part of my heart that is with you. And, um, and I'm always promoting what a great country it is to visit. So anybody who on the call who hasn't been, I highly recommend when things are safe to travel, please uh, go and visit. It's a great country. But we're here today to talk about um, the range of activities that the Unicenter uh, provides, especially to the university community around the world, to highlight the important work of social business and what it can uh, achieve. And it's, it's remarkable how um, I don't think so many people know about the huge number of businesses that Grameen is involved with um, as a sideline they, that led on from microfinance. And so it's a very exciting field to be in. And uh, I wish I were <laughs> younger, I could start all over again, but I certainly like to amplify the message about the importance of social business. So today we'd like to hear from you, Lamia, about what what it takes to run the center and what your challenges and your aspirations. This is what we were always trained when you went to the field at Grameen Bank to ask your borrowers, you know, what are your dreams? What do you want to achieve? Because once you can articulate that, then you have a chance of making a path to get there. So it's a real pleasure for me to do this. So let's start out by finding out um, how did you actually end up in 2006 at Grameen? Like what was the uh, tipping point for you to get there? Um, so I actually started at Grameen uh, as an intern uh, in 1991, actually, while, oh, I was okay. still a yeah, while I was still a student in at the university in the UK. 
And I knew already, because I was studying development, I knew already that I wanted to come back and work, work in Bangladesh and contribute in some way. And so when I came back, actually in 1994, Grameen Trust is an organization that Professor Yunus set up to help uh, organizations around the world who wanted to follow the Grameen Bank methodology to microfinance and helping poor people raise themselves out of poverty. And they were actually looking for some staff. It was just five people at the time. And on January 1st, 1994, I started as a junior officer at Grameen Trust. Um, and uh, I was just counting, actually, it's uh, going to be 28 years at the end of this year since then. So it's a long time. So, uh, and then 2006 was actually the year that coincided with Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for the efforts to uh, reduce poverty from below, as they said. And soon after the announcement of, of the Nobel Prize, Professor Yunus set up a special secretariat called the Yunus Secretariat uh, to basically deal with the huge risk interest that was generated from the Nobel Prize. It was well known before, but overnight uh, it went into the stratosphere. And I remember 3000 faxes of congratulations and uh, arrived over a weekend, you know. So my uh, professor has drafted me over from Grameen Trust to head up this secretariat. So this was the Nobel laureate secretariat to maybe basically respond to a lot of this interest around the world and also to support his activities during the year that he's the laureate. He traveled all over the world, meeting heads of states, uh, talking about his work, of course, the Nobel Prize ceremony as well. And then this in 2008, was uh, became the the Unus Center. So uh, you know, 2008 till today, I've been the ED of the Unus Center, and uh, the work of the Unus Center is basically, I would say, in brief, uh, uh, to promote the concept and practice of social business um, around the world. You know, of course, you were there, right? We missed each other. I left in the uh, July of 1992 and you came on. So we just had a very small overlap, but I was just thinking of the um, importance of the establishment of the center. And of course, it, it, that's when you were very involved in the center, but you'd had all that Grameen Trust experience. So um, has it grown over time? Um, obviously it's been a catalyst and enabling social change. What is, um, uh, at the 96 universities that you're now at in the 37 countries, how did that come about? Did you, and how do you um, start relationships with so many different organizations and educational facilities? So um, basically, uh, you know, the I want to just mention that the idea of social business didn't start in 2006. Uh, Professor Yunus was already, the, the Grameen Bank was the first social business we consider. And he and his colleagues had created a a number of initiatives, uh, uh, companies in Bangladesh that were designed to solve a specific social problem. And they're all designed to be self-sustainable. So they, that's when social business started actually much earlier than, uh, than the Nobel Peace Prize. In fact, in the Professor Yunus's Nobel Prize speech, I, I guess he could have spent his time talking about what he had done with Grameen Bank and microcredit, but he used that opportunity to actually spell out his vision of uh, a world economy where it's not driven just by the uh, profit, personal profit driven businesses, but where there's a space for social business and social business being defined as a non-dividend company that solves a social problem. And he basically said that the problems that we see in the world today is due to the fact that we have this uh, global economy that's driven by basically greed and we have to replace that with social business. So Unicenter Center uh, took it upon itself to uh, uh, because the social business had been operationalized already in the field, in uh, exposing people who are interested on how social business, what a social business is, how do you create one, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I would say in the early days, we were doing, uh, uh, you know, we, we were involved actually in uh, supporting the uh, initial phases of some of the joint venture social businesses that emerged, for example, Grameen Intel, Grameen Veolia, Grameen Uniqlo, the nursing college. Unicenter handled a lot of the uh, correspondence and uh, discussion around creating these initiatives, which later developed into separate entities and was spun off and had, had its own management and board. But we were quite uh, involved in helping to uh, start the early phases of those joint ventures, which are now in practice. There are more than 45 social businesses operating in Bangladesh, which were created by Professor Yunus. Some of them are very large nationwide programs mm -hmm. tackling things like uh, healthcare, education, energy, um, uh, access to finance and so on, and others are smaller. And then 
as people learned about these initiatives, so microcredit as part of social business, but more broadly, uh, around the world, there was more interest. So we started, uh, we were doing uh, internship programs, we were doing visits, immersion programs, exposure programs. That was one part of what we're doing. And then uh, this fostering, uh, the creation of joint ventures was one thing that we were doing. We were supporting Professor Yunus in his work because he remains the most powerful advocate for this, you know, and he has a, su you know, a super hectic global program. So we were supporting him in organizing his events, um, his uh, writings, uh, his publications. He's had uh, four books um, and uh, his interviews and so on. So that, that was also one part, I would say a very significant part of what Unicentre you know, was doing. Um, and then uh, con continuing the global advocacy and we have a very good actually uh, social media presence uh, with communications on, on these activities. Uh, our Facebook page has two and a half million followers, for example, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, the Yunus Center and Mohammed Yunus uh, websites. And also together with Grameen Communications, we help put the content for what's called the Social Businesspedia. This is a one, one stop uh, uh, in website where all the resources, based on the idea of Wikipedia, a social pedia for social business, where uh, all the information about social business, individual social businesses can come and put their information in there for networking and so on. So that was also a big part of our work. But over time, and you mentioned this about the universities, we found that a lot of universities got interested in wanting to start teaching social business in their schools. Um, and uh, quite often driven by young people, students who came to Bangladesh, they would go back and tell their faculty, why are we not teaching this? You know, why are we only taught the conventional type of business? Um, and so this was a start. And then 10, 11 years ago, we started the establishment of what's uh, called the Unisocial Social Business Centers, which is a, a center within a university affiliated with us in the mainly in the use of the name UNUS uh, to promote social business uh, within their university. And the form that that takes can be things like um, courses, short courses, certificate courses, uh, uh, projects in the community, research, action research, social business design competition, undergraduate degree courses, postgraduate degree courses, a whole range of things uh, started. And there was the first generation of YSBCs. Uh, HSC in Paris was one of the first ones uh, more than 10 years ago. Asian Institute of Technology established one uh, in Thailand also more than 10 years ago. Glasgow Caledonian University established one. All of these have had their 10 plus anniversary, 10 plus years anniversaries, Kyushu University and so on. And then this is followed. So we saw that this was a, an important piece. The universities contacted us. We didn't chase after them. And we thought this was important because this is where the mind shift, uh, mindset shift happens. And, you know, the young people had to be, you know, they exposed to the idea that you can have a conventional type of business, but you can have a social business too. And they can choose whether they want to work for a social business or work for a conventional business. They can choose whether they set up a social business and become an entrepreneur or will, will they remain a job seeker with the company. So those choices we thought was important that this uh, young people are giving the choice. And so that has rapidly grown. And now today and just last this week, we have 96 you know, social business centers Amazing. in 38 countries. Um, and uh, it's a very vibrant network. And, you know, we um, um, are in touch with them, but we don't drive what they do. They dis dis decide on their own activities. We are connected with them, uh, but they uh, decide, for example, GCU in Scotland is focused on healthcare. Kyushu in Japan is focused on technology for development and technology for solutions to the poorer people. So again, they, they decide what they would like to do. And our job is basically to facilitate their work and to facilitate connection uh, between them and uh, to uh, accelerate this work of introducing social business as, uh, into the curriculum of the university um, courses. But the, the breadth of this is staggering though, trying to manage all of this because I, I totally understand the point about it being demand driven from their side, but given that the name Eunice is attached to it, I'm sure you would like to have a quality control uh, measure on that as well. How do you um, oversee this and um, coordinate all these activities? 
So we like to think of ourselves as a connecting point rather than a controlling point. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen in the work that uh, Professor Yunus, in all his work, it's always, a, you know, this is an idea, you can run with it. And having a trust that in most cases, people will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in all of the cases for this YSBCs, uh, we have an agreement, a memorandum of understanding for the use of the name Yunus, because uh, we have what we have is a framework. The social business framework is driven by seven principles, very clearly defined, a non-dividend business that solves social problems. And it has a particular um, approach and philosophy in what it's trying to do, which is to empower people to solve problems in a sustainable way through business. So uh, our the, the agreement about the use of the uh, Yunus name is around that, that people follow that that framework and follow those principles. If they depart from that to do something else, then we can say that uh, we take the name back. We've never had to do this, um, but this is it. And I don't want to say that we coordinate, we try to facilitate. One of the things we do is create, help create connections between them. A lot of the YSBCs are collaborating among, the, among themselves on particular projects, on research projects. Some of them are regionally based. Some of them are, are um, uh, based across across regions as well, collaborations. Um, and then we we or help organize the conference, the Social Business Academia Conference, once a year, and a Social Business Academia pre-conference in June, so twice a year. Because this, again, the number of people who got becoming involved in the academia piece was growing. And they were wanting to have their own kind of sub-meetings, uh, which is separate from the practitioner meetings. Uh, so that's grown into a Social Business Academia Conference. And it's actually coming up in the start of November, 4th to 6th. And basically, um, it's free online program with some part physically taking place in, in Mount Kenya University in Nairobi. Um, and uh, what happens in the academia conference is uh, formal presentations of papers across a whole number of tracks, social business and healthcare, social business and technology, social business and, um, uh, uh, you know, the climate change and so on. There's a whole uh, number of tracks and we, we will have nearly 40 paper, formal paper presentations at the November conference. And it's free for anyone to watch, um, but we'll also have a physical conference uh, in Nairobi for that. So it'll be a kind of a hybrid conference. So this is very interesting. And there's some dedicated sessions on important topics on how to enable research collaboration, how to find the funding for research, et cetera, and so on. So this is, a, this is one thing that we do uh, to, we create a platform to enable, but most of these YSBCs are really driving their own agendas and their own activities. And they keep us informed and we meet them twice a year at the two conferences, one alongside Social Business Day in June and one in November alongside the Global Social Business Summit. So if there's a student listening who really would like to have a social business component at their university, um, do what's the process? Do they contact you directly and say, I really want to do this? Or do they, can you give them support to go to their university to try and um, implement such a program? Or what's the, how does it usually take place? Because I noticed there's a, a, a comment in, in the chat that's saying, we'd like to start a course. How do we begin? Yeah, so in fact, uh, Zenith, who was our MC today, she's the point person for the relationship building with OSBC. So you can actually write, write to her directly to start this. And basically, there's a kind of a, a, a discussion between the university and you know, center. There's a statement of intent, a letter that comes from the top, top management of the university to say, we would like to do this. And then uh, the MOU is agreed and signed. And basically, after that, it gets started. We try to make it as, as minimal as possible, but... Uh, Right now, for example, and I wanted to say that this acceleration in the numbers uh, indicates already that th this is already something that's become very well known around the world. Uh, we are, and I wanted to give the example of a university we were just talking to last week, which is in Portugal, uh, Nova, and they had a student uh, intern with us this summer, and she wants to set up a YSBC. But in her talk with us, which included Professor Yunus, she was saying that we already uh, we already have a social entrepreneurship course, and actually all we do is learn about your work. We are doing uh, uh, Professor Yunus's work and principles in practice, but it's under uh, not a YSBC yet. So uh, this is something that I've seen. I've gone to many universities, including the LSE, where there's a center for entrepreneurship that's already teaching this. So they don't have a formal YSBC, but they're already teaching uh, Professor Yunus's work in microcredit and social business. So I think this is something already that's 
very far reaching. And in many cases, a logical extension of that, uh, some universities are setting up OSBCs. But, I, you know, um, I uh, was, uh, I went to, when I was a student at LSE, we were being taught about Grameen's work in the International Trade and Development course. Uh, 20 years later, I went back uh, with Professor Yunus for the launch of his book at the LSE. And it was a complete sold out audience uh, in the main old theater, as well as a link theater. They were video uh, connected by video. And all the students, all the young people there knew about the social business work because they were studying it 20 years later. So this is already happening. And I think it's it's much more widespread than we we know, actually, I would say. And yeah, so, so Zenat, Zenat is the person to get in touch with and she's very swift and efficient in responding. I wanted to mention uh, something about the recent entrance we have eight uh, new entrants in the last six six months, uh, nine new entrants in the last six months, eight of them are from Africa, uh, East Africa and Central Africa and Benin and West Africa, because uh, this is a, 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 a region of the world where there's a large proportion of young people and young people are the ones who are wanting to use their talents and entrepreneurship to create solutions. So this is a, an interesting, uh, we have now currently a, a focus on African universities, which I wanted to mention. Uh, and that's why we are hosting uh, the, the summit and the Social Business Academia Conference uh, in Nairobi in November. That's fantastic. The next um, generation too, you've got now something called the Three Zero Club. Can you talk about that? That's a really interesting new initiative. And how does one form one of these clubs? Um, well, you must have, you must know already about Professor Yunus's uh, vision of creating a world of three zeros. Uh, he wrote a book which has been translated in many languages a few years ago uh, called uh, uh, Creating a World of Three Zeros. But um, the idea of the Three Zero Club is just an initiative that was launched just this June at our Social Business Day by Professor Yunus. And the idea is uh, uh, to familiarize uh, kids and young people and kids to the idea of Three Zeros and what they are. So we have the uh, Zero Net Carbon Emissions Goal the zero wealth concentration to end poverty once and for all, and zero unemployment by unleashing entrepreneurship and all. And the reason why uh, young people uh, are getting involved are, or, or we're encouraging their involvement is because some of the, the, these problems now are very huge and really urgent to solve, for example, the, the, the issue of climate change. Climate. The latest IPCC report tell us that we have a very short, small window within which to make all the changes we need if we want to survive on this planet. So it's not something that can wait till tomorrow. It can't wait for these kids to come out of universities and colleges to do. So we want uh, to encourage the young people to start thinking about these goals and to start forming these mini uh, self-formed mini clubs of five people to start taking actions to re achieve each of these three goals. And they can do whatever they want, but it's important to start taking actions and to uh, start doing that today. So this was something that, uh, you know, um, was launched in June, but we have had, it's actually not, you know, center is supportive of this initiative in that it's a, it's a brainchild and uh, idea of Professor Yunus's, but it's being uh, coordinated by something called the three Z global center and they're receiving the applications and processing them and they're being very uh, meticulous in making sure that each of these clubs are properly formed and so on not rushing their creation and now we have quite a, a lot of uh, clubs formed both internationally and in the country i'm not going to tell you the numbers i think we're going to be announcing those during what's going to be called the three zero club convention on the sidelines also of the global summit it'll be a gathering of all the clubs that have formed so far to talk about what they're each of them are doing and so on um and uh we're finding that uh, young people are being uh, quite excited by this. Uh, they feel excited that we consider uh, that a, an individual can, can can take an action that's important enough, you know, for Professor Yunus himself to give attention to and makes them become take charge. And this, the, uh, there's another second thing in this is that uh, this is also what Professor Yunus is saying that old the older generation, even people of my generation, the ideas are very outmoded. And what we are doing is not only not solving problems, in many cases, we might be creating new problems. So young people come with fresh ideas. They have a new way of looking at things. They're very adept at technology as well. And they have all the technology uh, enabled creativity to solve these problems and start now. So this is very important, I think. It's an idea of connecting young people around the world to take action to 
basically to save the planet, I would say, you know, uh, and for us to realize that it's not, we don't have uh, a long time to do that, that the window is closing, so. And how do kids form these clubs? How do they find out about this? Is there a website they can go to or? Yes, they... okay, I, I'm going to ask my colleagues to just put it in the chat box, but it's That'd basically three, three, zero dot mm -hmm. club dot org. It's very simple. And the whole process of how to go about setting this up and all the, it's a very, very systematic, the process of how to, uh, to apply for the club and then the steps that happen afterwards to be recognized and so on, all of that's given. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, their orientation sessions and so on uh, for those clubs. And many of them, and you were asking, what do they do? So they, they are not, we don't tell them uh, what, or the 3C Global Center doesn't tell them what they want to do, but uh, defines many areas where they can work. So there's a lot of them, for example, working on environmental and climate change issues. I found that many of them are doing that, but there's health and well well-being, there's circular economy, there's tourism, there's microcredit, there's food and nutrition, there's agriculture. So there's a whole uh, array of topics and they can choose, there's mother and child issues. I'm personally supporting one, one club here in Bangladesh that's working on mother and child issues, education for uh, where, um, for mum and children. So that that is the one of the groups that clubs that are formed here that I as, as a person am trying to support in some way. So you have the opportunity to become a support person. If you're not in that age group, you can be a support yes. person. Then there are also organizations that are support organizations. There are affiliating organizations, which are these YSBCs can become an affiliating organization for the three zero clubs and so on. So everyone has a role to play. So if you're not in that age group, it doesn't mean you can't get involved. You know, and again, our UNICEF Center is trying to just play a role of connecting these young people, if they so wish, to other social businesses, other networks, uh, other resources that may be available. I love that idea. I would like to be a supporter. I'm clearly not in that age group, but I would like to uh, provide the uh, support and um, space for a, a young group to do that. So I will be in touch with the... Uh, Three zero club um, to see how I can do that. And I'll put it on my website, amazingvolunteer.com because there's all sorts of ways. It's all about amplifying the message, right? As you say, a lot of things are done informally, but I think a lot of people, they, they don't know if their voice is being heard. And it's very empowering to know other people are doing this in other places, in other villages, in other towns and in other countries. And then you feel like we're a movement and we can join forces together. So that's one of the great things that Unicenter is able to do is amplify the message. Um, you talked a little bit about your two days, the, like these family gatherings you have um, and how important they are to connect with one another. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about Unis Social Business Day? Because I've been to one of those, which has, and is this the same that's going to happen this year? I know you haven't been able to do things um, uh, in person for the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but um, you know, do you want to talk about how you form, keep uh, the connections with these communities? Yeah, so we have uh, the Social Business Day that takes place in June every year, and we started that, the first one in 2010, uh, the very first Social Business Day, and it's become a kind of a a annual uh, family gathering, as Professor Yunus calls it, and it brings together practitioners, academics, NGOs, government representatives, policy policymakers, companies. So this is one very unique feature is that it's not a one kind of person that comes in. It's many types of people are coming in. And the idea is that they learn from each other, their presentations on the experiences of what uh, somebody is doing in a particular social business and how they've achieved scale. So that's energizing others who are interested. People meet each other. They learn from each other. We have technical sessions, workshop, workshop sessions, uh, plenary sessions, you know, Pecha Kucha sessions, all kinds of things. Um, and there's a lot of networking and exchange. And I think the main thing is that because we are going against the mainstream, which is still conventional business, is that we gain energy from each other. You know, we don't feel like, oh, this is something I'm battling on my own. And you find that this, and each year, so we, in 2010, we had 500 people. A few years uh, later, that had go, uh, grown to more than a thousand people. The last time we physically had the social business day, that usually takes place uh, in Bangladesh, but also we've had it in Bangalore and Bangkok. We reached more than 2000 people in, in, in uh, coming together uh, from all over the world. It usually comes from 70, 80 countries people are coming. So that that is grown. And then uh, there's the Global Social Business Summit, 
uh, that takes place in, in November. So the one in, we were hosting in Bangladesh, one of the things that was an add-on and which was we considered quite important is that people after the formal sessions in the in the conference room, they could go out and actually see the social businesses in practice. And I think that was all, always a very important part of how people learn about Grameen and about microcredit and social businesses, this immersion into seeing it firsthand. So we always put that in. So that was something that was important. The social business summit was taking place in different cities. We've had them take in November take place in, uh, in Berlin, in Paris, in uh, Mexico City, so on, and that's depended on who's wanted to host it. Those cities have wanted to, they've said to us, and this is something we do with Grameen Creative Lab, which is an organization in, uh, in uh, Germany, uh, which is headed by Hans Reitz. And he basically in 2008 decided that he'll give up his, his other uh, conventional business uh, life and start joining uh, social business. And he's been helping to organize the summit with us for since 2009. And uh, where there was interest in hosting it, they would uh, host us and we would go. And again, it's very similar. Uh, CEOs, company CEOs, uh, practitioners, academics coming together. So it became two, two times in the year that we were having this big gathering. Uh, usually uh, the summit was not 2,000 people. It would be around five to 700 people, the one that took place in these other cities. Um, and uh, the Social Business Academia Conference became a full-fledged conference taking place at the same time as the summit since 2013. And that is something that we are organizing. So this year we are having the 10th Social Business Academia Conference. And that's it became clear that the academicians wanted to have a separate discussion about research and more technical dis discussions and paper right. presentations. Yeah, so that's, that's something that's taking place. And then similarly, uh, back in uh, the Social Business Day, Many academics started attending that and they decided to have a pre-meeting. So we have these two meetings, uh, big meetings, the Social Business Day and the Summit, and we have two acad uh, academia uh, meetings as well twice a year. And this year, actually, we also hosted in April a very successful um, Youth Entrepreneurship Forum for Africa because uh, that was hosted in Harare, and but mostly virtual. Uh, Social Business Day was hosted in Kampala. So we have had an Africa focus this year. And that youth entrepreneurship workshop was uh, very uh, well attended. And it demonstrated to us that we could do this conference online. You asked about that. It was done almost entirely online with some presence in Harare, but mostly online. And I was just looking at the Social Business Day figure for this year. So we had 200 and, uh, 2,322 people registered you know, for 27 sessions. All of these are online. We had country forums. We had um, academia forums. We had all of these uh, sessions. We had 162 speakers. So we've actually found that it's uh, uh, you can do this uh, uh, off online as well as a virtual without a physical and probably at and definitely at much less cost because you don't have to travel to this place and damage the climate and the ozone layer and the process and so on. So we think that. Uh, uh, even if we start doing this physically again, I think we will always make sure that there's a virtual part because many more people can attend, you know. Yes. Not everyone has the money to come to attend the conference. Uh, so this has worked well for us and we've we found it. And then the other event that we do is this lecture, this web lecture series, uh, which you and I are now conducting. This is the 25th one. Uh, and it's designed as conversations between social business practitioners and a moderator and to serve as a resource for the YSBCs and a wider community. So they get saved as a resource for people to access because at a conference there's a 20 minute presentation, but this is something you can go deeper and it's something that's saved for people to access. And we found that uh, our sessions by the end of a month that it's been online, 100,000 people have viewed it. So that also has a great impact. So there's this advantage to virtual events that uh, we've been able to, I think, take advantage of. That's fantastic. The other thing we were talking about um, earlier, uh, when you and I were had a chat last week, the competitions, I'd love you to talk more about that, because that's another way of reaching out to um, get people to uh, participate. And uh, it's very exciting what you were telling about in Montreal at the HEC Business School about the process that's involved, but it's, it's so you're educating people as you go along, but then there is a financial incentive at the end to establish the business. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about that because I didn't know about that aspect of the center's work. 
Um, so the design competition has actually, uh, you know, been taking place for many years and uh, through many organizations as well. So HEC Montreal, I would say, is probably the most established global one now. But this is uh, the design competition has uh, formed part of what one YSBCs are doing to a lesser or greater degree in many places. You know, so some of them have made smaller competitions, not so so big. This one's very elaborate in that it's a, a nine month long process, and they have various rounds. And the rounds include, uh, uh, you know, uh, training on the principles of of social business, also, uh, you know, how to put it into practice, how to design a social business come up with a plan and so on. And so there are many rounds and it's a global one. So people, there are also regional primary, you know, regional uh, uh, events leading up to the final global one. So this year uh, they've been doing it HC Montreal for, for, for six years and it's really grown because they now have the support of many organizations that are financing it, but also they had the largest number ever of applications. You would have thought in pandemic, it would have been less, but they had right. 800 applications this, this year. Fantastic. So it's been the big, biggest ever. And just three nights ago, October 1st evening in, in Montreal, they had the grand final night. And I, um, Professor Yunus had a message there and I was present for the, the award session. It was very early in the morning. It was very exciting to see because there's a whole variety of social businesses represented. And there were 10 prizes actually, not just one, but there were 10 prizes. The top three prizes were large, quite large cash prize. The top pr cash prize was 34,000 uh, Canadian dollars uh, to start that social business. And the winner was a, a Vietnamese uh, social business called Nano Neem that's creating biopesticides, so environmentally friend, friendly pesticides you, using the neem uh, you know, plant, which is actually something that we have in, the, in South Asia as well. But in Vietnam, they're doing it in large scale and that company, and it's mostly young women who are running that, they won it. They could not be physically present for it, but they were there in the Zoom meeting and got very emotional when their names were announced. And then they had a second prize and a third prize. And then you were mentioning that are they all financial prizes? They're not. Some of the five of the prizes of the 10 are actually prizes to uh, to um, entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs to attend an um, entrepreneurial course or an incubation course yeah. for free yeah. with a particular specialized institution that will carry it out. So, uh, you know, it's not always cash prize. Sometimes the cash prize is seed money to start the venture. Sometimes the cash prize is just a small incentive. Sometimes you just get a certificate. And then other times it's this... Um, taking part in the incubation course. And we will be la launching one in November, which will be centered in Africa, but it's a global competition, social business uh, design competition, and it'll be announced in November. And the winners will be, uh, again, I, we expect it to be a, a, a few months long and the winners we hope will be announced at the Social Business Day next year. So this will be centered on the three zeros and social business design competitions, open for African universities, the YSBCs, but also globally. So it's a global competition, but we are uh, organizing it together with uh, our university partner in Zimbabwe and all of these other African universities that have joined in recently. So that's one that's coming up. Um, and, you know, we, uh, it's as you said, it's something that provides training and familiarization with social business, how to practically create one. And then if you get the funding to actually put into practice, you've actually created social businesses. So this is something that's become a very effective tool, I would say, for creating social businesses. And the HSC one is just one example, but a very good one, I thought. No, it's a fantastic um, model. And it's really a great way to talk to um, the business community about even if they're not yet prepared to set up a social business within their corporation, they can support um, the movement through a prize. I was very impressed that my old bank, the Bank of Nova Scotia, was one of the funders of this prize. And so if, you, if banks and um, other uh, profitable corporations can put some resources behind this movement, I think that'll just give it more of a recognizable um, platform that people will uh, be interested in participating in. So uh, it's very exciting and I, certainly something I want to explore a lot more. Um, we're coming close to yeah, the end. Yeah, Scotiabank, I, want I, want, I just want to mention the Scotiabank thing is that they put, provided the money for the first prize and yes. the representative from Scotiabank, as he was giving the prize, he was saying, go out and change the world. He didn't say go out and create a business that makes money and also does yeah. some good things. He actually said to all the young people gathered there that we are very ha happy to support your 
efforts to sit, go out and save the world. So this this shift is happening, and you know, it's a, we're just glad to be able to help that along. It's fantastic. Um, I was listening to Fred Swanaker, who runs the African Leadership University, the other day, and he was interviewing um, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala. Um, and uh, who's the head of the World Trade Organization. And so I'm just gonna borrow from him. He had a couple of quick questions um, that you have not prepared for, just about you personally, uh, Lamia, which I think it's great to, we all know the kind of um, energy and force that you have in directing the center, but it's also kind of nice to uh, get to know you on the personal side. So here are just a couple of questions. Uh, how would your family describe you in three words? Um, obsessed with my work, I think. <laughs> That's four words. <laughs> so, you know, my dad, when I was, before I got married, when I was, uh, I was living with my, my parents, every day I would come home and debrief on all the exciting things that were happening in my work. And my mom used to, my dad used to call me Grameen Total Recall. I remember that. So I think that something, but you know, I, uh, for me, my work is very important, but my kids are also very important. And I, I find that this work, allows me to integrate both, you know, because my son who's here with me, my seven-year-old, he knows a lot about my work he's been picking up on. He knows about the three zero clubs. He knows about the social business day events. And I find that very good because I think people can't have a separation between what they do professionally and what they're doing in their private life. It has to be together. And I think social business and the work we do is something that, that does that, you know, uh, yeah. if someone goes to a bank, earns a lot of money, comes home and then does other things, uh, you know, this is this is much more, I would say, just sort of integrated. Um, you get to you know. live your passion, which is yeah. fantastic. Uh, fill in the blank. Leadership is dot, dot, dot. Uh, courage and steadfastness, I think. Terrific. You know, I, yeah. And uh, if you could choose anyone living or deceased, who would you want to have a conversation with? Oh, uh, maybe Nelson Mandela. We met Professor Yunus. He invited Professor Yunus to deliver the 2009 Nelson Mandela uh, lecture. And there was the, one of the great moments when uh, Professor Yunus was speaking on stage and Mr. Mandela was sitting uh, on, on stage applauding him and applauding his ideas. So he, he's also another, alongside Professor Yunus, one of my heroes. And of course, uh, we lost him. So I, would, I think that would be one. Mine too. Um, well, we want to wrap up, but we definitely want to make sure that you have the opportunity to sort of concretely describe in a couple of main uh, ideas, what are your main messages for our audience today? What are the things that you want to make sure people take away with uh, so they can be inspired to go forward and, and make positive social change in the world? So this is something I've actually learned from Professor Yunus and my senior colleagues in the Grameen family of companies, is that even though they were they started programs that have become huge, massive nationwide programs starting out 40 years ago, that when they start a new initiative, they're very focused on making sure that the first steps are, uh, you know, very clearly defined, that it's systematic, that it's, uh, you know, checked through by trial and error. Uh, this is uh, the two, two examples. One is the Nobin program. This is a, a venture capital fund, social business venture capital fund to allow the children of Grameen borrowers to start their own businesses. And there's 66,000 of these entrepreneurs now in Bangladesh. This was started in 2013. Uh, um, and I was astounded to see, because I was there to watch it, that every step of that, every step, what should be the first step, what should be the first a format, all of those were so, these little things were just being discussed in long meetings, you know. So each little step counts, you know, you, if even if you do plan for a global initiative, those initial steps in testing your methodology and testing that what you're going to do is going to work is very important. Uh, and I, I think that applies also to the Three Zero Club initiative. I'm seeing the same level of attention and care being put to the first steps. And that the other thing which is also exemplified by the Three Zero Clubs is that no one is too small, you know, no one is too unimportant and no action is too insignificant. Everyone will say, oh, my, well, what can I do to change uh, the climate uh, issue or something? But, you know, the, on Ozone Day, the Three Zero Club members in Bangladesh, they all went out and planted a tree. It's just one tree. Many of them, there were 15, 20 of them who went and did that. But, you know, uh, that one tree is important and it has an impact and all of those add up. You know, so I think people should uh, uh, 
realize that no, you know, that uh, no one is too small, no one is too young, and no action is too insignificant, and that you know maybe we should we should start now because our time is running out. So I would say that, and that courage and steadfastness, not to be discouraged because there will be people to oppose you and to challenge you and to get in the way, uh, and just to be continue to be steadfast. No, you're right. There, a lot of these problems are so overwhelming, but just starting with one small step. And uh, Professor Yunus often talks about that. You just take that one small step and then you put your one foot in front of another and keep going. And there are a lot of naysayers out there, uh, but for usually profitable reasons. And um, you've got, we've somehow got to get them on board too, to say, you can still make some money, but we've got to all protect the place that we all call home together. And uh, it seems that social business is an amazing combination of uh, bringing all groups of people together to be able to do that. So I really appreciate your time today. We all know how busy you are and uh, the dedication that you have to have um, made such an impact at the Unis Center and with social businesses around the world. So uh, I just like to say thank you for taking this time. And uh, it's been a absolute pleasure to have a conversation with you. Um, and I'm supposed to hand over to Zenat, I think, and I'll say Abarta Kahobe, because uh, that means see you next time for those who don't speak Bangla. Um, uh, because I do hope to get back there. Um, I know, you know, we have to be very mindful about uh, the trips that we take on uh, aircraft now and what Im impact that has on the planet. But uh, Grameen Bank and Bangladesh changed my life because I saw what things happened on the ground in the field by people who were um, didn't have much money. And when you see large numbers of people uh, make positive change, it's incredibly inspiring. And it's it certainly spoke to me and I know it's spoken to um, tens of thousands of people around the world. So what your organization has done for so many of us um, as being our beacon, um, showing us the way is really most appreciated. So thank you for um, your time and energy and dedication. Thank you. Thanks, Ina. Is that the yeah. right time? Yes, perfect, on the okay. dot. <laughs> thank you very much. This has indeed been a great, great conversation. Um, both uh, Ms. Susan and Ms. Lamia have addressed um, uh, the key points. And I think we, uh, like, I really didn't even realize how we passed these 45 minutes because uh, it was just like a story. And uh, Susan, you did a brilliant job in addressing the main points. And from Ms. Lamia, we heard the main activities that UNICE Center has been doing. Our YSBC, the academia part has been a great focus because it brings in young people, young um, you know, minds and students with great, great ideas. Um, and then we also have our internship programs, exchange programs with students who are visiting us every year. Then we're also busy with the three zero club that's also involving even people younger than college going students uh, from 12 years to 30. And um, in addition to, we have the vaccine campaign. So our Unis Center is doing a lot of work and um, it's a lot of, we're communicating with a lot of people. So Miss um, uh, Lamia is actually taking the headache of everything. I mean, there's a lot of things, maybe sometimes you might not hear back from our emails very, um, you know, in a short time, it's because we're getting thousands of emails and like Miss Lamia's copied in pr practically all of them. So uh, it's a lot of work on her plates and we try to distribute it among our colleagues um, who are supporting us. And I think it's a great pleasure working with Miss uh, Lamia Morshed um, and I'm sure all of our colleagues and everyone who have associated with her can say the same. Uh, she doesn't act much like a you know boss that everyone has to be scared of, but she's always taking our ideas and our feedback, which I think is great and makes a really hospitable working environment. So that was just a bit from my end. Um, so thank you very much, Lamia Apu. Uh, we call her Lamia Apu at UNIS Center. Um, so uh, this has been a really, really great conversation. And I'm sure if uh, people want to know more on uh, social business, on our UNIS Social Business Centers, our vaccine campaign, our 30 Club, everyone can email us. Uh, the links and uh, the emails will be provided in the chat box. And um, so please keep on sending your questions, your comments, your uh, questions, concerns, and keep, of course, keep attending our events. We are doing all virtual events so everyone can attend them from all parts of the world. Upcoming 
coming is our Social Business Academia Conference and our Global Social Business Summit from November 5th, uh, sorry, November 4th to November 10th. So um, I welcome everyone to join. Uh, now we will watch a short presentation on it. But before we conclude, I just want to thank um, all of you for attending this session. And of course, to our speaker and moderator, uh, Susan, who has done a great job today. So thank you very much. I request the IT team to play the slides for our upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. events information on this will be posted on our social business media and our social media pages so please join us in our upcoming events thank you very much see you again soon thank you Bye.